Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Sandeep Agarwal. Um, what I'm presenting today um, is uh, on municipal amalgamation. Uh, and some of it has already been written uh, uh, related to Halifax and um, uh, Toronto and other parts of, of, of Canada. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover some of that and I will uh, sprinkle it with some of my experience at, at various places. Um, so let me just uh, quickly talk about uh, uh, my, my journey, um, and it's, it's an, I think it's an interesting one, very different from, uh, from troopers. Um, obviously, I'm not a politician. I'm an academic. Um, the picture there shows Winnipeg and onwards, but there is a journey before that as well. So I grew up in India, and I came to Canada in 1990, and uh, the first city that I landed was, was Winnipeg. Uh, and there I did my master's. Um, but I would say, and I confess right here, um, I never thought that I would become a planner. I had no idea. Um, so, like Paul was saying, you know, he was dreaming about cities and he was going to city halls. None of that with me. Um, so growing up in India, um, you know, as what happens in South Asian countries, uh, there's a lot of push for engineering and accounting and those kind of professions. And I used to love chemistry. So, uh, and then as what happens in India, you know, you appear in these national exams and you get ranked across the country. Some million or two, you know, people, students appear. And then back then, there were only 2,000 students who would get selected out of a million. And we would go into these five premier institutions called Indian Institute of Technology. And now there are six or seven, I can't remember. Um, so anyways, um, so um, I got into um, chemical engineering, which is what I loved. And all of this happens right after high school. So you finish your high school, and you are in an engineering institution. But you fill out all the forms in grade 10, so you can imagine. So grade 10, you fill out the form. Grade 11, you appear in the exam. And you know the result in grade 12. And you are in one of those institutions. So anyway, so I got into chemical engineering. And I'm plugging away happily. And a uh, year, year and a half later, I got a letter from a thing called Proctor those days. This Proctor from the institution saying that I was uh, moved to architecture. And I, so I went to see him. I said, look, I can't even spell architecture. I don't know what it is. Uh, he said, well, look, uh, this is what you did in your form. In your, so in the form, you have to list your preferences of engineering. right? So you want to do computer science, chemical, metallurgical, what have you, you list it. And I'm looking at it. And it just occurred to me at that time that I listed my preferences in an alphabetical order. So obviously, architecture was the top. Um, and there I was. So I told someone, and the person said, what the hell were you smoking? And I, I don't know what I was smoking. But anyways, so that's how it was. Um, so I was in architecture. And um, oh, I'll tell you this, though. My mother was, was, was a geographer and an artist, and she taught for years. So I had that, that side of it, but I had never explored it, I guess. Um, so I, I, I loved architecture, and then um, I worked a little bit, and then moved to University of Manitoba, which is where I did my planning. I thought architecture was a little bit limited in that sense. You were just talking about buildings. but So planning, I, I really, really liked. So Winnipeg was the first place where uh, I had uh, my exposure to planning. And there, I remember, we were talking about secession of Headingley from the city of Winnipeg. And I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Never, never saw it, never heard of it before. Um, and then I, I moved on. I worked there a little bit uh, after doing my master's. Uh, then I moved to the US. Um, uh, did my PhD at the University of Illinois at um, 
uh, Urbana-Champaign, uh, which is just south of Chicago. And I worked there a little bit uh, with uh, Champaign County, which is entirely rural, except for Urbana and Champaign, the twin cities where the university is, is located. Um, and I also worked for um, United States uh, Department of Defense, which is just impossible to do now, but back then, yes. Um, and from there, I moved to St. Louis, city of St. Louis. I worked with the city of St. Louis. Um, and some of you may or may not know, uh, city of St. Louis is the first home rule city in the United States. Um, and home rule, as you may know, is that it gives a lot of power to the city. I mean, the city doesn't have to go to this, this state and ask for permission. So basically, you know, it doesn't need any express uh, granting of, of uh, whatever they want to do. So it can have its own system, taxation, political system, what have you. So there's a lot of uh, leverage. And many cities in the US are home rule uh, cities. Uh, so from, from St. Louis, um, I moved to Toronto. I got my first academic position. And there again, I was in the midst of amalgamation. Like, OK, secession and home rule are now amalgamation. Um, this was about 98, 99. Again, quite interesting times uh, at the city. And uh, so I was there for about 15 years. Um, I moved here just a year, year and a half ago. And I began to hear about annexation and then amalgamation. Uh, this was uh, amalgamation, speci especially when I believe it was the president of uh, Edmonton Chamber of Commerce uh, who was talking about amalgamation. Uh, and that um, led me to do a little bit more thinking about amalgamation. So what you see is a result of, of some of, of some of those, those thought processes. Um, I just wanted to just uh, make one disclaimer. I want to be clear that um, what I'm saying is not reflective of city views. And I'm saying it because I sit on the Edmonton's uh, subdivision um, development appeal board. So it's, it's, it's just an academic speaking, OK? All right, so uh, this is how I'm going to progress. Um, just talk quickly about uh, amalgamation, some key points, and I'll come back to them uh, later on. Uh, talk about five governance systems, examples within each governance system, examples from Alberta, and then I will conclude with, with a few remarks. So essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to across the country, uh, from Toronto to Halifax to Winnipeg, British Columbia, and come back here to give you a, a bit of an idea of what has happened across the country vis-a-vis -vis annexation, amalgamation, de-amalgamation, and so on and so forth. So here are a few things. Um, amalgamation is a result of the exceptionally rapid urban growth in the areas immediately outside the boundaries of central city municipalities. So it is driven. It happens mostly because there is a lot of growth happening. Okay. Um, if you look at the amalgamations uh, elsewhere, uh, they've all been premised on cost savings. But the literature and the works that others have done have shown that um, not much savings have, have resulted from it. In fact, it has cost more uh, to the, the bigger municipality. Um, third point, amalgamation has usually been a political move. Uh, so. You know, it's not necessarily rooted in a good model of governance of some sort. It's usually a political move that has resulted into uh, sort of the restructuring of, of metropolitan governance. And uh, the last point is um, uh, the amalgamation could work in some metropolitan situations and, and does carry some benefits. It's not all negative. It does have uh, some benefits as, as well. So. Um, these are the ones that um, I was uh, going to talk about. Um, and looking at last 50 years of, of um, uh, governance system and changes um, to it uh, across Canada. So annexations and mergers, such as that there is one main uh, municipal government for the metropolitan area. Uh, so we'll talk about annexations and mergers. We'll talk about two-tier metropolitan government. Um, and then we'll talk about amalgamation of two-tier metropolitan systems into a single municipality. Uh, we'll talk about de-amalgamations. 
And then I do want to talk about the regional uh, districts in, in British Columbia, which I think is a good, good model uh, for us to look at. So we'll start off um, close to, to, to uh, our home here. Um, so this is obviously Calgary. Um, Calgary's uh, territory has increased incrementally as a result of continuing series of annexations. Uh, Forty or so uh, have happened um, over the years. Um, and some have been controversial. We, we know that. And uh, some have uh, generated intense opposition. Um, and um, but I think if if you look at the the city and and talk to city officials, is basically the official position is that the city wants to maintain uh, at least a 30-year supply of developable land within its boundaries. So it is about um, accommodating and planning for the future growth. So city is taking annexation as a way, uh, you know, strategy for for growth management. Now. Interestingly, Calgary is a very unique situation in that sense. Um, Calgary's annexation, just looking at the number of annexations have happened, I would say Calgary's annexations have been largely successful because they did happen. Um, and I would say it has happened because Calgary does not have any significantly large municipality nearby. So most of the annexations have sort of, you know, tinkering at the edges and, and moving forward, uh, which is obviously not the situation anymore in, in Edmonton. So um, from another, um, this is about merger in, in Halifax. So just to give you a quick background of, of what happened here. So uh, Nova Scotia government commissioned a report um, and this is uh, before the province wanted to amalgamate the Halifax area. The report recommended the amalgamation of the cities of Halifax, Dartmouth, the town of Bedford, Halifax County, and the Metropolitan Authority. And, and it said that by doing that, um, it would result into um, lots of savings. Um, again, we've talked about political moves. So initially, the, the premier was, was opposed to an amalgamation, but then he re reversed his position and promoted the amalgamation as a strategy to reduce government spending and promote economic growth. And as a result, in 1995, um, a legislation was passed, and the Halifax Regional Municipality was created. And this was in 1996. Interesting things, uh, this is from the chief administrative officer who was the first CAO of this amalgamated um, HRM. Um, so he said a few things. Um, first is that the transition was too rushed. Um, that what happened was prior to amalgamation, each of these municipalities, the former municipalities, they began to initiate a whole bunch of capital projects and they ran into serious deficits because they probably thought that, hey, you know what, it's not their problem. At the end of it, it's going to be all amalgamated. Um, now, common public expectation is the amalgamation reduces the staff, um, which in turn will lead to cost savings. But that did not happen in HRM. In fact, it drove up the cost because if you bring down the number of staff in-house, then uh, what you have to do is uh, bring consultants from elsewhere and then pay them a lot more to do the stuff which could have been done internally. But I think the, the worst of all um, uh, is that the a new HRM inherited 31 collective bargaining agreements and that needed, needed to be reduced to five and the whole thing which was estimated to cost around $10 million dollars um, the final tally was about uh, three times more than that. Now, this, these are all the bad things that I've said at the time of, of the amalgamation and in the years after. Few, few interesting things have happened. So there are some positive side of this as well. One is that it resolved the long-standing inter-municipal disputes about solid waste disposal. Because now they're together, and now you know they agreed upon uh, what they were going to do about the solid waste disposal. The second was about the uh, water supply. 
So what was happening was prior to amalgamation, the city of Halifax, um, which sort of was sitting on a huge reservoir of water, refused to sell the water to Dartmouth. And then it was creating a lot of chaos in Dartmouth. But after amalgamation, you know, that, that, uh, that problem was, was overcome. Uh, the third was, um, prior to amalgamation, Halifax and Dartmouth, they were competing against each other to bring uh, companies and high techs and manufacturing and so on and so forth. And um, the, f the competition was very, very fierce. Uh, and again, it was at the end of the day, it was hurting the municipalities. But with the amalgamation, it stopped that competition to happen. And uh, so there was some, some savings uh, on that. All right, so that was about annexations and, and mergers and those kind of things. Um, Two-tier metropolitan government, and uh, I want to talk about this um, using uh, Toronto, Metro Toronto, as an example, um, because um, Metro Toronto, um, this is before the amalgamation happened in the 90s, um, was a poster child of successful two-tier system. Um, the upper tier Metro Council was created by the province in 1953. Um, it lived from 1954 to 1970 for about 15-16 years um, and as basically the idea was to um, bring about some of the urban, rural and suburban municipalities uh, together um, so that um, you know, some of these service crises and infrastructure crises could, could be overcome. And Metro Toronto actually did a lot of, lot of work uh, in a relatively order way orderly way, uh, but about 1970 or thereabout, um, it began to face a whole bunch of problems. But three, among those three were, were quite, quite important. One was that um, the suburban municipality that you see, um, Scarborough, North York, these are the former municipalities, their, their population began to rise. So central city remained uh, what it was, but most of the population rise was happening around the central city. And um, these suburbs were unwilling to uh, have their tax dollars go to the central city. So that was the basic point. Uh, the second one was that most of the new growth, new urban growth was happening outside of the metro area. So the growth was going to Peel and Durham and York and some of those places. And, and that was causing a lot of stress on, on the Metro, Metro Council. Third was that um, Metro Council, um, in about 1988, the province allowed that the members of the council would be elected. And that just increased the friction between the municipal level um, uh, politicians and the so-called Metro level uh, upper tier system. So these three reasons just caused so much of chaos that uh, the province had to step in and, and dismantle the Metro Council. Um, this is an example from Winnipeg. So it just not happened in, Winni uh, in, tr in Toronto, but Winnipeg as well. So in Winnipeg, um, the corporation of Greater Winnipeg, and that lived for from 1960 to 1970, uh, was created by the province of Manitoba brought together 12 or so urban municipalities uh, in the Winnipeg uh, census metropolitan area. Uh, and um, again, the perception was that you know, this, this uh, corporation uh, was superior than the local municipality. And again, the friction was, was so intense that um, it was abolished uh, in about 10 years. All right, so coming to the amalgamation, and this is the amalgamation of um, two-tier metropolitan system into a single municipality. Um, I just wanted to s say a few words about um, metropolitan government and two-tier metropolitan government. Um, so essentially, um, metropolitan level is the upper tier. Um, it's not necessarily superior to the local level, they have their autonomy in different ways. Um, and this type of system 
uh, was experimented um, across the country uh, from 1950s to 60s. Some of them um, you know, survived and some of them are, have been abolished. Uh, but the two uh, that I want to talk about, again, are Winnipeg and, and Toronto. So the first of the two tier systems to be abolished was of Winnipeg. In 1970, the NDP, um, at that time it was the ruling party, created a single city of Winnipeg, a unicity, uh, to replace the corporation of, the, of Greater Winnipeg. So basically, instead of having two-tier, single municipality, uh, a big one, and um, they called it the Unicity. But again, the problem growth, growth, growth. Um, most of the growth was, how, was happening outside of Unicity, and uh, over the years, the Unicity became irrelevant. Still perhaps exists in some form, but uh, not being talked about much. All right. so. Let's uh, spend a little bit more time on, on the amalgamation of City of Toronto because it's fairly recent. Um, so this uh, uh, amalgamated City of Toronto came about in 1998 um, and it was the result of uh, the uh, intense urban growth that was happening outside of the metro boundary property tax inequities, service crisis, infrastructure, you know, things that, that you know. Um, and in 1995, uh, the then Premier Bob Ray asked Ann Golden to look at the issue and see what, what can be done. Now this task force in 1995 was quite skeptical of the benefits of any large uh, consolidations. But as you know, uh, the government changed. Uh, Mike Harris, uh, who was elected and was committed to smaller government, less government, and he bought into the idea of, of uh, creating one uh, mega city. And um, so that's what you have. Uh, from the provincial point of view, mega city eliminated a layer of government, reduced overlap and duplication, and reduced the number of politicians. Now, amalgamation resulted in several issues. Um, one was the expense, and I talked about it. It costs more, which is what happened here in Toronto. Um, so expenses on fire services, garbage, parks, recreation, they all have increased. Um, city, you know, the, the has, uh, has now an untenable financial problem, uh, and uh, it has um, collected a lot of debt. It's about 1.2 billion. Now, keep in mind, city in about 2005-2006 um, got some more power from the province, the new city charter uh, that it got. But you have seen what has happened. So David Miller came and said, you know, more taxes on if you drive on city roads, uh, more taxes if you buy uh, properties. And then Rob Ford came and he eliminated one of them. So city council, even though the city has the ability to generate revenue uh, through taxes, but it has been quite reluctant to use, use that power. Um, again, just on and on, staff positions, um, they were reduced, but uh, then they increased quite a bit. Um, and now it is uh, at its uh, highest peak. It was 2,700 or so, now it's about 4,000. Uh, employees there. Um, now, this is interesting. Taxes, especially on business property, uh, have, have come down. Um, and But what has now happened is the competition is with Peel and York and Durham region. So you have the amalgamated city that's competing with the, um, the big suburban areas around it. Um, some also argue that uh, amalgamation has resulted into decline in, in citizen participation, that such a big uh, city and the government is now uh, very much removed from, from the citizens. Few benefits, um, and you probably have noticed it, um, Toronto has a much stronger presence uh, in economic development. Uh, it has a stronger voice uh, in the region. Um, 
it has resulted into more or less fair share of tax base um, among the four or five former municipalities. It tried to equalize the local services as well. So those are some of the, the good things uh, that have happened. Now I think we'll talk about de-amalgamation because this is where I started uh, my days in, in Winnipeg. So whether you remember or not, this goes back to 91, 92, uh, the Herengli area, uh, the, the west side, uh, was allowed to secede um, from the city of Winnipeg. And here was the, here was the, the problem. The residents of Herengli, and there were not many, there were about 2,000 or 3,000 of them, they, kept, they were protesting that their tax dollars were being used for the urban areas of the uni city and wanted to get out of the uni city. Same is the problem with HRM, the Halifax Regional Municipality, because you have a huge rural area and urban area, and I have been there and I've talked to city officials and, and residents, and rural area folks think that all the tax dollars are going for building bridges and roads uh, in um, Halifax and Dartmouth. Anyway, so that, um, that, is, um, that has led to de-amalgamation in the context of, of Winnipeg. Now, um, British Columbia, uh, this system of regional bodies has survived all of this tumultuous period of the 50s and 60s and 70s and is still there. Um, just to give you a quick background on this, so these uh, network of regional districts uh, throughout the province were created back in 1965. This is still in place. One of them is Metro Vancouver, as you know. Um, and even Quebec has similar uh, bodies there which were established uh, uh, very recently, just, just uh, five or six years ago. Um, so just very quickly what, what these regional districts do. Regional districts uh, replaced many existing intermunicipal special purpose bodies and they act as an institution for increased municipal cooperation. They are governed by a board of directors, not a council. So these are not elected folks. These are, these are just directors of the board. And, um, and the members of, of this board uh, have multiple, sorry, have multiple votes depending upon the size of the population they represent. And a municipality can opt out of um, a district if it wishes to or could buy into it. And uh, this, uh, this district, this uh, body uh, provides uh, housing, transit, water, sewage, so those kind of things. But it doesn't intrude into the autonomy of local municipalities. So it doesn't govern land use and you know, those, those kind of things. All right, so coming back to Alberta, uh, and I want to just uh, have a couple of slides. Um, the two minutes, I'm going to rush through these. Um, now, Alberta has its own history of annexations and mergers, and, and you know uh, most of them. Uh, Edmonton's uh, annexations and mergers uh, date back to 1912, we know that. Um, last major annexation happened in, in 1982, um, and we know the new annexation proposal and, and all the uh, unrest that, that, that it is, is causing um, in, in the process. Um, so just, just to come to the conclusion here, um, so I'll go back to my question, is, is bigger better? And I think the answer is fairly obvious, no, not, not necessarily, it depends uh, where and what we are talking about. Um, I'll come back to the key points about amalgamation. It is the rapid urban growth that, that results into amalgamation. Um, and we have seen that across the country. Um, it costs more, so we have to be cognizant of that. Um, so careful what you ask for, you may just get it. Um, so, uh, and usually there is no, no cost saving. It tends to ac exacerbate the rural-urban divide. Um, so, so we need to be mindful of that. Um, amalgamation is a, is a political move um, and not really based on any good model of governance. But the fifth point I think is very important, which happened in the case of Toronto and to some extent in Halifax, that 
it gives a better presence, it gives a better voice to this, this bigger, bigger municipality. A uh, few suggestions that uh, you may or may not like, um, but we can have some discussions around that. Um, one is that um, I, I think that we should bring those regional commissions back, um, which were eliminated back in 1995 that Trooper talked about. Some of it is already happening, and we see that through a CRB in the Edmonton area and to some extent in, in Calgary area as well. I think one of the problems with the regional commissions back in the early 90s and 80s was that they were, they were not only doing the regional planning, but they also had the responsibility to serve as a subdivision approving authority. I mean, that's not the place to do subdivision approvals. It, it lies at the, at the local level, so that autonomy of the local municipalities need to be respected and, and maintained. And, and the third thing is that they need to be kept unelected, uh, but with a very strong regional mandate uh, focus. So I'm sort of um, framing this as what you see in, in the case of uh, uh, British Columbia. So just in a nutshell, um, that uh, again, we need to revive these uh, commissions, but with unelected members. Um, and like BC's regional districts, the commission should be tasked with not only make regional plans, but if the municipalities opt, uh, then these bodies could provide services like transit, housing, uh, and police, and so on in the unincorporated areas.